click the links to join the channel here over at subscribe or check out the rumble and odyssey thanks for the rumble support so uh, exclusive uh, yeah I, how many angels can dance on the head of a pen because it's just as relevant so they give an exclusive and pointless and sad interview that makes you want to throw your phone across the room but there is a few points all while ignoring the massive elephant which is the political or ideological messaging in American comics that is so different from Japanese manga. And American stuff doesn't sell, and Japanese stuff does. You know, sometimes it just seems like, oh, well, first of all, nobody in this, who's given an interview to these people is ever going to ask a real question because they're just not going to, they're going to get a BS answer and they're just not going to get another interview. So it's all just, it's all just pointless, but it fills out CBR articles. I mean, they raise a couple of good points, but it, there's that one glaring point, the emperor has new cl no clothes point, that you seem to be very comfortable skipping over. So the thing is, it's more than just sales, it's a whole vibe and energy that is behind manga that is gone from the America American propaganda comics. The mainstream industry was so bad that one Richard Meyer was able to crowdfund his Jawbreakers comic, and uh, with his YouTube channel at the time, Diversity in Comics, and start an indie comic movement called Comicsgate, which has turned into a nice little way for newcomers to sell their stuff on YouTube. But it really took off because the mainstream comic industry was not making stuff that appeals to their audience, which again is another way of very simply saying it. You're not making what is selling to people. And when people say stuff like that, the SGWs get immediately defensive and they start tossing out ad hominems and they argue that comics were always left wing. Yes, they were left wing, but they weren't anti-white to this current extent where 90% of the bad guys have blonde hair and blue or green eyes. You can literally correctly guess protagonist and antagonist just by eye color. That's how obvious it is. Because one, they hate European people. And two, they're terrified to make a pox and antagonist. So the comics are very formulaic, which, you know, there goes the only suspension of disbelief. When, when the story is asked and answered on the cover, you, you, you see two characters you know the story just based on how much ink is is used to uh, to draw them. And uh, as a consequence, well, they sell less and less every year. European people want to see themselves represented well in comics. Why would they pay to see racist hate directed at them? And finally, finally, people are starting to awaken and just kind of be more honest about this stuff. So two pointless points they make are about uh, in a, a shared universe and about making movies. A shared universe is a non-issue if the sales continue to drop every year. Your world-building deck chairs on the Titanic. First, you focus on writing stuff that people actually want to buy, and it's not going to be a female pox character that has to fight Neo Hugo Boss characters for the hundredth time in Idaho. It's, oh no, it's a militia in Idaho with all these blonde farmers, all these potato farmers. It's, they're, gee, they're all blonde. It's another militia. Oh, hey, Ms. Marvel. Hey, Captain Marvel. You find that again? Yeah, yeah, Captain America just fought them last month, too. Weird. Weird. There's a whole lot of militias in Idaho, and they're all... They're, so, I mean, you couldn't find any any non... Any, uh... You know, actually, most militias in America are not, uh... Are not of European origin. That's, I guess that's a little bit of an un, un, uh, awkward... Uh, most, uh... uh ADLS, PLC, ACLU is listing all these hack groups in America, and, um... They're not white ones. So uh, you're not going to see that in comics, though. Or you'll see a, like a blonde motorcycle gang is terrorizing a small town. Like, is this a is this a movie from the 50s? Because, I mean, that didn't even happen in the in, in the 50s. But somehow, I mean, Hollywood made it happen. It's like, oh, we're seeing that in current current year. Another. That's weird. I mean, there are other issues in America, other groups you could have terrorized big cities, actually, whole whole big cities. They're not. They're uh, not. They're not green-eyed guys on motorcycles, though. Anyway, oh, hey, look, a blonde mugger robs a pox walks lady and pushes her down a flight of stairs. Gosh, weird. Oh, what's this? A blonde guy robs a liquor store and shoots three people. What are the odds? Oh, hey, a blonde carjacker. It's not always going to be that obvious, but there'll be always, there's always, always one group that will never be represented. It is all so tiresome. The SJWs get triggered when you bring that up, but why would you overrepresent one group as the antagonists and another as the protagonists unless you just want to make it clear how much you hate one group of people? Yes, we're well aware of that by now. Shouldn't the representation be fair or at least uh, you know accurate to the country's def demographics? 
not in American comics, which is why they don't sell and people read Japanese comics in manga, you troglodyte. He makes a point about comics expanding into film, which might be an interesting way of saying it's worth it to sell these low-selling comics, you know, so you own the IP in the hope of Netflix picking it up for a streaming show. If they're willing to do it with Mags Visaggio's Vagrant Queen on the Sci-Fi Network, then there's there's hope for everyone, I guess. Of course, that show failed because it was woke cancer. The comic was an extremely low-selling comic. As all of Kim and Kim, it's gone for three different versions. I think they've all sold uh, five and under because uh, of the axe grinding that just won't quit. And Vagrant Queen, hey, a, a pox walks... BLT woman is in the lead, and her sidekick is is a a blonde guy who's kind of an idiot. <laughs> Gee, Max, we're we're haven't seen that one before. Yeah. So like these Venn diagrams of areas of interest. Uh, Pox woman, okay, that's a pretty small Venn diagram for the comic mind audience, and she's BLT, and she's in an interspecies interracial relationship with another another alien female. Okay, um, and the blonde guy's an idiot. Okay, well, what? How? What's the Venn diagram overlap? Uh, a thousand, a thousand, a thousand what units? A thousand what groups of of comic? No, no, no. It's like a thousand comics sold. Well, that's that's a very small overlap. Um, so that's kind of the long shot hope for any independent comic that some network picks it up and gives it a shot for a season, and either it hopefully it takes off or even not the writer can somehow get involved in something else in Hollywood because streaming money is much better than comic book money, which is probably why you see the modern comic approach, which is to throw everything against the wall and see what sticks. If Hollywood was smart, they'd look at Comicsgate, but that will never happen because when you look up Comicsgate in a search engine, you immediately see the search results return the name with Hat Group. Uh, yeah, I'm sure it's going to be a huge character. And, uh, and Istophobic which is not the end of the world because even just selling comics is is okay. That's a, that's fine. Um, and most stuff is not going to be made in streaming shows or cartoons anyway. If you can make a living selling comics on YouTube, Rumble, and Odyssey, that's an amazing achievement. Like, not everything has to be made into a $200 million movie. So they make a point about the limits of digital. Uh, comics are not made to be read on a phone, fine, and tablets are still too small. The issue is the entire story has to be formatted either for paper or for the 10-inch standard tablet. It's one or the other. I read stuff on my 8-inch uh, tablet, and it's worth the convenience, even if you have to move the screen a bit. Maybe somebody can invent a dual 10-inch clamshell um, screen tablet, something like that, where you could open it up and you'd have a, you'd have a, you could have the effect of the double-page spread, or or even like two tablets that could just work together with like a shared screen app would probably be the easier way to do it. So in th their next point is going into a comic book store where the customers were manga fans and it had more of a female audience. And I guess they had no idea who Frank Miller was. Keep in mind the Dark Knight Returns, I think was 86. And even the movie version of Sin City was a long time ago. Younger people are not comic book fans today. Why on earth? <laughs> what are you giving them? Why would they be interested in it? And more important, why would, there, why would you be passing it on to your kids and grandkids? Why would the next generation be interested in it? Because you still have comics out there. And if people are coming across, going back to like The Incredible Hulk, you go back and read that decades ago, you know, back in the 70s or something. You read comics in the 70s, you're like, oh, this is pretty good. And then you, you come come forward 50 years, you're looking like, what happened? What happened, Grandpa? Uh, well, the SJW Bolsheviks got in there, which is why you got you to gotta gatekeep out these green-haired weirdos. Is it is it women, Grandpa? Yeah, a lot of it, a lot of it. Women, soy boys, cat ladies, whatever. But you know, it is what it is. Um, so what? Uh, they had no idea who who Frank Miller was. American comics suck. Manga doesn't insult the audience with diversity, BLT, toxic Bolshevik propaganda. They just draw beautiful characters doing cool things. They write what sells. American comics are only interested in a story about the patriarchy. For the thousandth time, I, I just I didn't care the first time. And, and I, I support the patriarchy. I think we're, we're coming from opposite ends here. Like, everything you're against, I totally... Uh, all this estophobicism? Um, no, but I really love European people. I don't want to see them as the as the uh, the bad guy in every single comics. Every comic they do is, oh, we hate blonde people and Hugo Boss. It's it, So what about communism? Can you, can you, can you t tie into that at least a few times? 
because uh, Hugo Boss really isn't the threat today. It's it's actually Bolshevism is the threat today, but you're not going to see that. So American comics lecture, Japanese comics don't. Or, you know what, it's like Japanese comics are propaganda too. Whatever, whatever, maybe they are, maybe they're not. But whatever they're doing is working. You should probably try to do what they're doing. If you had a comic that you brought to a publisher, so you had the characters done, the first thing it would say was, oh, hey, this is great, but you need to make the antagonist blonde and race swap your characters. They can't just sell a comic. They have to put it through the cultural Marxist agenda machine. Hey, you've got a straight blonde group of heroes. Yeah, that's not going to work for these publishers. Ironically, it would sell because the audience loves those Scandinavian Aryan types, the blonde hair, blue eyed, cheekbones and jawlines, you know, skiing through the forest, whatnot. It sells, but the publisher would rather lose money than have an antagonist from the wrong area of the world. So no, you're not going to introduce American comics, even an indie publisher of Frank Miller and DiDio, uh, to a manga audience. Why would they when they simply have something better to read than than what you you know what what your propaganda is? They'll say what I'm saying. It's diverse cancer and Bolshevik propaganda. If you can make American comics look like manga, then maybe it'll sell. But that means almost all the characters have to be fair and light. That is a bridge too far for the mainstream. They have to do elf quest and rings of power, everything. And then um, what happens? Oh, you took something that people wanted and you turned it into propaganda. And and immediately all they can do is ad hominem you. And you go, but the stuff you're selling or you're trying to sell doesn't sell. And what the Japanese are doing is selling. Why don't you do what they do? Oh, but their characters aren't diverse enough. But we, we I think we clearly have different value use here. It's like the things you're selling, you're, you're trying to, you're, these ideas you're putting forth, all this Bolshevik nonsense, it's not it's not selling to the widest audience. You're in this weird business where you're trying to, you're not selling people what they'll pay for. You're trying to sell people your ideas that they don't want. You're trying to sell, I mean, that, that's like, what other, what, how else would you describe that but propaganda? And as for getting a female audience, uh, good luck. All you did was chase away your male audience. SGWs think humans and the sexes are fungible. They're not, but they seem to try to force boys to read girls' stories. They just don't like them because boys aren't girls, which is probably a hat speech for them. Anyway, like, comment, subscribe. Uh, check out the subscribe star. Thanks to uh, LG and Vegan for all the uh, all the help over there, and I will see you guys all next episode.